Hey, Brian. Uh, going into this game, what is your – like, what's your overall view of Atlanta? They've, they've kind of, uh, you know, gone through a little bit of a roller coaster this last year or so. Um, does it seem like a team that the Sounders measure themselves against in any capacity? Well, <clears throat> you talk about on the field or off the field or both? I mean, both, like kind of broadly, you know, broadly speaking. Broadly speaking, the comparisons are, look, we both play in, you know, big stadiums. We both have a lot of fan support, although their counts, you know, are a little bit higher uh, um, you know, on field success. It was lights out. Then they had a little bit of a, well, I shouldn't say down period because I think they still, you know, did pretty well when the open cup or something uh, had a, some good results. Uh, and now they're with <clears throat> Gabriela Heinze. <clears throat> and, you know, that's an interesting, you know, interesting hire. I, I, I actually went and watched his clips, his highlights of when he was a player. I mean, he was a hard nosed player. And so when you kind of study film, you study your opponent, you do a little background checking into, you know, who's coaching the team. Cause a lot of times the, the personality of the coach comes through the team. Uh, so I'm not so sure we measure ourselves against Atlanta, but there certainly are a ton of comparisons. Jeremiah, if that, if that's the direct answer to your question, it's certainly, you know, they are a tremendous franchise. I think we're a tremendous franchise. Uh, you know, they want to win. We want to win. Um, they've got great players. We've got great players. I mean, there's, there's a lot of similarities there. Brian, talk hey, about, uh, Andrew Thomas, the one of the best goalkeepers in our college soccer, just a two part question. What excites you about him the most? And, you know, with the goalkeeping room that you have with Steph and, with Steph and Steph in Cleveland and Richie, uh, how excited are you to can, you know, come into a room with those three and, and start to learn from them? Well, Andrew's an up-and-coming young player that we had our eyes on. He's trained with us in the past during the summer months. And so, look, when we were able to, you know, snatch him, grab him when he came available, it's just another, you know, good young player to try and develop. I will say that he will learn a lot, not just from Steph and Steph and Spencer, but again, Tommy Dutra is the best goalkeeper coach in the league. And he's going to, you know, try and maximize Andrew's potential. And then we'll see what happens. Hey, Brian, the, the phrase catch game gets used a lot. Uh, it's sometimes way too much. Uh, what is this, it? What did you say? What was the phrase? Uh, 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 catch catch game or trap game, you know, when you play a, a team that okay. maybe you're not okay. going to be. Uh, okay. Obviously, this team hasn't started great, but they're a high-pressing team. They like to get numbers forward. Uh, despite ha missing Barco and Dam and a couple of other players, uh, uh, how do you approach this game and how do you get the guys focused on the task at hand? Well, uh, A number one, Nico, I disagree with you on a couple of points. Uh, we have not messaged this, and I don't think the players are taking this as a trap game. I would say that other teams are coming after us because, you know, we started off well. I would say that, but we're not taking Atlanta lightly. Uh, we actually started the film process our first day back in training, which is unique. Uh, normally, we kind of debrief the last game and then move on to the next opponent, but we've already showed them clips because it's a new team, uh, a pressing team. I mean, look, you know, Martinez is an unbelievably talented attacking player uh, and they press with a different formation. You know, obviously they've had some injuries with Franco and, you know, some key players missing. Uh, but I'm not so sure I'd call them a pressing team. I know at home, the last game against Montreal, they pressed higher up the field. Heinz does have his specific way of defending, but you know, for us, we don't know what they're going to do. They might sit back at home. They might, they might say, okay, look, Sounders are playing pretty good. They might match us up a little bit more than what they did against Montreal. So I'm not so sure they're going to full out press. If they did, Nico, that's fine by me. Uh, 
at, but, but, but for sure, a hundred percent to the question before, I mean, to Jeremiah's question of Atlanta, Seattle comparisons, I mean, they're a great team and we're not taking them lightly at all. Hey coach, uh, what, if anything, are you seeing different from Christian Roldan this year in the three, five, two, as opposed to what he's been for you in the past number of years in the, in the other formation? I think it's similar. Uh, I, I, I think what you're seeing is Christian loves that inside right pocket. He, his movement in behind, whether he did that coming off the wing in a four, two, three, one, you know, whether he does it as he's playing now in our three, four, one, two, uh, he, he still has done that. Now, if you set him back in a four, two, three, one as one of the two holy midfielders, then Jackson, his, then he plays a little different. You know, but right now, I think the, 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 the numbers, the, you know, the formations, uh, Christian's still enjoying success in that area of the field. Do you think that he's stretching the field more and utilizing his speed maybe a little bit more than he used to? No, I think he did it with, in 4-2-3-1 as well. I mean, I, I, I can remember a goal. <clears throat> I can remember a goal against the Galaxy where he was 30 yards behind Jordan Morris and he catches up. Uh, I can tell you that his running into the prime assist zone has always been consistent. I mean, I, I, think, I think the formations or, or where Christian is playing in the two different formations is pretty similar. Hey, Brian, staying on Christian, what can you say about his maturity? Because is it fair to say that he's really matured his game? Doesn't matter where you play him, his ability to read the game. I think he's always, always had that, Moz. Again, I might disagree with you guys a little bit here, you, the folks out there. Um, you know, Christian has played maturely, you know, almost from the minute I inserted him back in 2016. He's always had that little bit of cerebral kind of thinking the game through, Moz. I think he's always kind of done that. What you saw with the captain's armband and maybe leadership in the locker room, if that's your direct question, yeah, then he's, then he's kind of like, you know, matured a little bit and he's got a bigger voice and players pay attention to him. But as far as on the field is concerned, I think he's been like that since day one. And what is it about your team, the ability to, to make in-game adjustments? You just talked about Atlanta could come at you different ways. LAFC's came at you different ways. Portland's came at you different ways. It's, it's, it's great to have, Moz, a group of players that can take the information, digest the information, understand the information, put their own little, put their own little personalities and in, in what they saw on the field into the information that we as coaches give them. And then they go out and execute some of the changes that we've tried at halftime. It's just, again, credit to the players buying into this system because the messaging has been, you know, look, again, it's when, you know, Nico plays that number 10 position underneath Montero and, or, or Will and, and, and Raul, you know, different than Christian. And if Christian, if we build that into a house or we've even talked building it into an inverse house, we played 4-3-3 three, three the other day. I mean, they all understand the basis is the three center backs and how we shuffle the pieces around in game at halftime. That's what I enjoy the most because the players are smart enough to understand that. I'm kind of um, taking it back a little bit to uh, Atlanta. It's been a minute that y'all played um, Eastern Conference teams. Obviously, you had the, the match against um, Columbus. Um, is there a style that's uh, different uh, with Eastern Conference versus Western Conference? I know that Atlanta's underneath some new changes, but when you're preparing for them, is there anything that way that, um, that would be different? Jada, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a, a tangible difference between East Co Eastern Conference and Western Conference. What I would say to your question, and it's a good one, is that each team within each conference has a distinct style. And so we as a coaching staff were, you know, kind of excited to get a new opponent. You know, it, it gave us, you know, something to do. It, it certainly made Ravi Ravameni and, and Jorge 
uh, the video guy gave them a good project to work on to give us coaches the you know, data and the visual information that we needed to complete our game plans. So in that sense, you know, it's different, Jada, but at the same time, I could also answer your question by saying, yes, you know, the Eastern Conference or Atlanta, they play like this, this, or this, but we're at home. And my expectation for this game is the same, where we go out and we try and dictate tempo to them. We want to be on the front foot. We want to make sure that they understand that this is our home and there's a noticeable home field advantage in MLS. You know, picking, uh, piggybacking on that home field advantage, this is going to be the first game uh, in a year and a half almost that you'll have a real supporter section. Uh, is that something that you are, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're looking forward to it personally, but is that something that factors into the game at all? Does it like, what are your emotions surrounding the possibility of a packed, you know, uh, Brahm end? Well, uh, my little social media post today about getting my little ECS uh, membership card in the mail and the swag was, you know, obviously I love being part of that group. Uh, I love the fact that we have passionate fans, Jeremiah, not just in that area of the stadium, but all around the stadium. I think the people that have been to some of our home games through this COVID period have made a lot of noise, but yes, the atmosphere, the full, the full, you know, bro and all of that sort of stuff. It makes it feel like we're kind of coming out of this a little bit. You know, things are starting to get back to normal. We have a long way to go. We want people to get vaccinated, but it feels like kind of a normal sounder game. Coach, go, go, ahead, go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Coach, um, how are you, Alonso? Coach, uh, I wanted to ask you, compared to other years, you know, uh, the Sounders may lose two to three players since the national teams are announcing their rosters. Uh, this is the, the perfect time, do you think, for the Sounders stretch the, the difference between the first place, second place, and start making uh, like the, the home advantage field for the playoffs? Yes. Well, I'm not so sure we're... <laughs> I'm not so sure, Roberto, we're thinking about the playoffs yet. I mean, we still, and we as a staff, as a coaching staff, I mean, you guys might think this is corny or I'm just saying this, but every game is important. We, we take each game in a 34-game season and, you know, we plan for each individual game to try and get results. We don't plan, okay, we've got two games this week and then three next week. And so this is the easier game and this is what we're gonna do. And blah. we don't talk like that. Obviously human nature, you look at the standings, you see the standings, you know, we talk about, you know, what it would be like if we finished first. Obviously it's one of our goals is to win as many games as possible. But, you know, for us right now, it's just about Atlanta preparing for a new opponent and trying to get a result. Coach, um, the Sounders released Alex Roldan um, at the end of 2019. Was the plan always to bring him back essentially on trial in 2020, or how did he get back in the fold that winter and spring? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, some of that stuff, you know, you can ask Garth about. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, Alex, you know, had some talent. You know, there was some... You know, there was some, you know, is he going to sit behind, you know, Kelvin Leardam? Is he not going to get a chance to play? You know, did he want to move on? You know, there are conversations about, you know, his playing time and his development. Where's the right position for him? What is the right position for him? Because you can see that he's a talented soccer player. I mean, everybody can see that. We just needed to find the right place. And, you know, his, his, you know, having to work for a job and, and, and play and, you know, really have a little bit of adversity. He rose to the challenge and, 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 you know, check that box. He, he, he did it, you know, he had to do it on his own. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, a little bit of adversity actually makes you stronger. 
And I think we're seeing a stronger Alex rolled in than, than many people thought. And so at some point, did he come to you and, and pitch the idea of switching to fullback? And if so, how did that conversation go? I think, I think memory, Jason, you know, it's, it's a while back. We had kicked it around a little bit as a coaching staff, you know, with Alex a little bit. You try him a little bit in practice and then you see how it goes. And, you know, then I always enjoyed Alex's, you know, he's like his brother. He's tenacious. He's competitive. He's got some of those, you know, starting points. So for us, the conversation was, where can we get Alex on the field? Because he had these, he has these attributes. So, you know, I'm not so sure. Moment, a singular moment where he came to me and said, hey, I want to play right back. It wasn't anything that dramatic. It was just multiple conversations over. All right. Thanks, coach. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. Hey, Brian, staying on that Alex Roldan uh, conversation, uh, there were a couple of reports just recently that said that uh, he uh, told the Guatemala national team that he didn't want to go. He didn't have any time. He was focused on the Sounders. Uh, what does that say to you about Alex? And although you never mental on uh, players' decisions, uh, would you like to see him wait as he has the double citizenship to perhaps play for U.S. or play for Guatemala? Yeah, we're wondering where those stories came from, of course, because I don't think Alex said them. But whatever the reports are out there, um, you know, that's it's good for Alex. My opinion, Nico, is that if the kid wants to make a commitment, and Jimmy Traore was the one, because we, we sat Alex down with all of the coaching staff, because sometimes I have meetings with one, just me, myself, and the player, or Alex just happened to come by at the wrong time. All five of us were in the room and we asked him questions. Okay, what do you want to do? How do you, what do you see? All that sort of stuff. And Jimmy Traore asked him the most important question for me. It was, Alex, you have to make that decision from your heart because national teams, you play for pride. It's, it, it, it's, it's about the, country that you represent and if you don't think you're going to get a chance with the u.s and you want to try guatemala well you have to commit to that fully you can't just go there and say okay yeah i'm going to give this a shot and if it works great if it doesn't it does you know you can't do that these are national team appointments this is a big deal for him and so i thought jimmy's question to alex that only alex can answer was, was a good one. And we'll see how it all plays out, Nico. But for me personally, if Alex went to Guatemala and had a, and had a big role within that team, I would be happy for the kid. I had a two-parter. Are you saying that Alex didn't say that or wasn't called up or as far as the Guatemala national team? Well, Jada, I wasn't privy to any of those conversations either. I was just poking a little bit of fun at all. The, I was just poking a little fun at some of the watchdogs out there that are, you know, that are, you know, on top of stories that I don't even know about. Um, Alex has to make a decision first to commit to Guatemala prior to him being called in. Because he has dual citizenship, he can elect to either go to Guatemala or elect to stay and not go to Guatemala in maybe long-term U.S., who knows, uh, but those are his choices. Okay, I understand. Um, my other question was that when you have a situation like you do as far as the goalkeeping situation, um, is it important for you to see a player a couple of games in a, in a row, or do you want to, um, or do you like prefer to give a test to each one or how, how do you kind of um, build new consistency with a keeper? Well, look, Stephen Cleveland did a great job last game. So I'm going to stick with him. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, that's fluid. That is a fluid situation. Um, certainly you want to give enough time. You want to give him a run of games to get comfortable to see really where he's at at the same time. You know, Steph was, you know, doing well at training today. He's running on an ultra G. Um, you know, does Spencer get a couple games? Uh, who knows? There's fixture congestion, congestion at the end of the season. 
I mean, that's all a fluid conversation, Jada, that I can't tell you right now that, you know, Stephen Cleveland's going to play these next three games and then Spencer's going to get two and then we'll wait for Steph. I mean, I, I'm not that rigid. Brian, just to be clear, you said that Stefan Fry did some running and he said something about a G. I didn't hear. I just want to be clear and get this right. Alter G. It's where you, awesome. take, where you take the pressure off a person coming back from injury. Okay. Maz, it's a type of rehab assignment that alters the amount of gravity an athlete can place on their body while running on a treadmill. It's a specialized type of equipment. The best in the business. Thank you, Alex. And I'd that be was and, and I'd be I'd be careful to write because you know a slow jog is running, but he's just testing himself. So it's still way early in the it's still way early in the process. But Steph is a tough kid. So to Jada's point, I mean, when he comes back, then we'll have another decision to make. Brian, well, can I to talk it. about him decisions wait, wait a second john jada go ahead please i was just gonna ask if you could share anything about the decisions as far as new who and being called up with uh, the camera national team there's there's no decision for my part uh jada that is again uh a, a well-deserved conversation you know new who getting called in that's you know that's cameroon that's the coach there they see that he's playing extremely well. We don't have any control over that. Okay. I just wanted to ask about, um, you said yesterday, Brian, that Nico's going to be shut down till June. So just talk about the thought process behind that decision. Uh, that one was, yeah, that one was one that I discussed on, on the radio Look, Nico's in, in knee is still inflamed. They, they, they're having a hard time getting the inflammation down. So for me, the way we look at it is, you know, we've got a longer break at the beginning of June. So we can take that whole block of time. There's no rush to get them back just for two games. And then you have three game, then, then you have a three week break, you know? So look, if something miraculous happens and Nico can play against Austin, fine. But more than likely, we'll just shut them down and, you know, just wait till we reboot the season again uh, on June 19th, I believe it is, Alex, right, against the Galaxy? I believe that's right, Schmetz. Yeah. Guys, we'll, we'll take one or two more, perhaps, just so we can transition over to our next speaker, which is Javier Ariaga, and we have our trusty translator, Bob Sutton, for those who know Bob. But Schmetz, before we do that, do you want to tee this group up for any news this afternoon? Sure. Uh, yeah, there will be an announcement later this afternoon about a new signing. I think you guys uh, will know the player. Uh, you know, he's a really, really good kid. I actually uh, thank Will Bruin because the battle between Sissoko and Will Bruin this preseason and the ability of Sissoko, A.B. Sissoko to, you know, kind of hang with Will, you know, gave me the confidence to sign him to the first team. So Sissoko will be eligible to be on the bench this weekend against Atlanta. And I'm, and, you know, due to the injury to Jordy Delam, uh, he will be on the bench. And if we, if the game needs him, we'll, we'll put him on. Brian, with your uh, new, uh, formation and just the way that the season has gone for you, as far as the success to start, um, when do you expect teams to be able to break you down, um, yeah, you know, I mean, when, like, you know, if you were looking out and you had the hot team out there that had a new formation going, I mean, when, when did you, when did, would you expect that coaches would have maybe things to, tactics to kind of counter you? Well, Jada, I would think that they're watching film of us already. So whether they try and find a way to slow us down, uh, whether they devise some tactic to try and slow us down. Again, the hardest thing in our sport is just to accomplish those tactics. You guys have heard me say, you folks have heard me say that um, I, I, I prepare my team to play against 
you know, LAFC. And I believe they're going to play 4-3-3. And then at the last second, Bob changes and he plays a three-man back line. So Jada, I can, I can devise all the tactics. Other coaches can devise tactics to play against us, but the players on the field really have to make, you know, make the plays to help their team win. Hey, hey, Brian. Brian. Charlie, go ahead. Charlie, go ahead. I was going to say we're going to take one, maybe two more, and we got to get Brian out to his next call. So, Charlie, go ahead. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hey, Brian, Charles Brown from OLA Soccer. I wanted to follow up on what Jeremiah asked at the start about uh, the sort of these sort of whale clubs, for lack of a better term. I mean, I know they're not your rivals or anything, but Atlanta and Seattle are kind of the biggest clubs in the league in scale wise. Maybe you'll have more eyes on your match than you, than you typically do this weekend. Th does that give any extra oomph to the game? Are, are players aware of that? Do you sense a different um, buzz from, from an occasion like this? Um, you know, it's interesting, Charles. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I go so far as to say that they take stock into we're the two whales of MLS or one of the whales of MLS. But what I do say is they are, you know, same as us coaches, they are excited for a different opponent, an Eastern Conference opponent. I think that adds a little bit of spice to the game for sure. But I wouldn't say that we are, you know, inside the locker room, the guys are saying, oh, well, they got 40,000 people the other day. So let's go out there and kick their butts because they had more fans in the stands than we did. No, they appreciate, you know, Hindman, they appreciate Guzan, they appreciate, you know, all of the good players that they have, you know, Martinez, everybody. I mean, that's what they appreciate playing against. Guys, is there one more before we close up today? And then we, uh, again, we'll transition over to Javier Ariaga and Matt's going to take it from, from there. Any other questions for Brian? You know, yeah, just real quick, do you have any updates on Josh Atencio's health? Uh, yeah, he was in training this week, Jeremiah. So I expect him to be involved in the game. 